Hi third graders, we are here with PAX chapters, I believe I'm going to be reading 26 to 28, Ooh, so we're getting really close to the end, I appreciate those who filled out that survey, I felt like it would be kind of fun for us to pick the next book together, so if you haven't done that, please go ahead and vote for which book you'd like to hear, um, alright, chapter 26, Kid. Peter twisted around so sharply he nearly, he nearly fell over. He'd been certain the guard station was empty. He'd watched for ten full minutes to make sure before leaving his corner. A soldier came out from behind a truck. He lifted his rifle butt to the sign chained over the barricade. No entry. Peter straightened up as tall as he could on his crutches. It had been two days since he'd spoken to anybody. No, two days since the bus driver had said... I don't know what you're really up to, son, but I doubt it's a good idea. You want and I get you on a bus back tonight. No shame in that. And Peter had replied, no thanks, because there would have been shame in turning back. And then the bus driver had said, all right then, good luck, and let him out. Not a soul had spoken to him that night. The town was on the perimeter of the evacuated area, and the few people had passed cast their eyes down picked up speed as if they couldn't afford to make contact with anyone who might need help. Nothing extra here, their look said. Already, all is lost. The next day, from sunrise to well past sunset, and the most of the morning, he had traveled on roads through vacant towns, past abandoned schools and playgrounds and neighborhoods spookily silent without their squeaking tricycles, their car radios, their pickup ball games, the only familiar sound had been water running through garden hoses when he'd filled th his thermos. He hadn't seen any other humans. He'd seen the animals they'd left behind. A skittish pony tugging up grass in front of a church. Dogs eyeing him um, bayfully from behind dumpsters. Dozens of skinny kittens, cats sliding away, their flanks hollow as spoons. Here's a little picture. He looks very lonely. Hey, kid. The soldier moved closer. He eyed Peter's handmade crutches, the rough cast, the dirty clothes. We evacuated this area almost two weeks ago. Where have you been? You don't know that? I, I know that, but I left someone down there. I'm going to get him. Take it easy. We checked the records. Everyone's out. He's not a person. Peter jetted his chin to find the soldier to argue that this mattered. Instead, the soldier's face changed, became somehow younger, and Peter saw that he wasn't that long out of high school. He slid his rifle back into its sling. I have a dog, Henry. He didn't say anything else for a minute, just looked down the road as if he were hoping this dog of his would suddenly appear. Then he turned back and sighed. I don't think anyone's walking him. My sister said she'd do it, but she works. Want to see his picture? Even before Peter nodded, the soldier had drawn out his wallet. He held out a picture, a beagle, an ordinary beagle. Peter's throat hurt. The corners of the photos were worn soft and colorless. That picture had been taken out a lot. That's Henry. I got him for my eighth birthday. His hips are bad now, but he's, he still likes his walks, you know. Still likes to sniff out squirrels and stuff. I told my sister that, but Henry won't understand where I've gone is the thing. He'll wait at the door all day for me. What's yours look like? I'll keep an eye out for him. Pax isn't a... Peter stopped. As if it didn't matter that Pax wasn't a human, why should it matter that he, was a he wasn't a dog? He's red, black legs. How big? Coyotes are out here. They have pups this time of year. They'll take down a small dog when they have a, little t a litter to protect. He's pretty small. Peter shifted his weight off his blistered palms. Please, I've come a long way to do this. The soldier gazed at his photo another minute before slipping it into his wallet. When he looked back at Peter, he seemed older again. We're holding them, but they're coming. You go in. You've got to be back out by tomorrow. He pointed at Peter's crutches. You can do that? I can, so you'll let me through? The soldier looked around and leaned in. This road is patrolled hourly, but we only guard the main trail entrances. No one is stationed in the woods yet. You would travel 20 yards in, no one would stop you. But listen, if you get caught, I didn't just say that. Now get out of here. Thanks. Peter turned and started 
for the woods before the soldier could change his mind. Kid, I hope you find him. It was quiet in the woods, but here the quiet was right, and it was broken by the sound of wild things which seemed to promise. Here, Peter could imagine seeing Pax's red brush flicking between the trees. Here, when he called, it was easy to imagine an answering bark. These things raised his spirits so much that he could almost ignore the pain in his palms and in his armpits bleeding and raw. For an hour, he pegged over ground that was so springy with decades of fallen pine needles, it seemed to lift him. While he heard the rough growl of a jeep, he ducked behind some brush until it passed. After that, he walked along the road's edge, sure that when another patrol went by, he'd have enough warning to take cover. And then he was there. It wasn't a landmark he recognized or the way the road straightened out of its curve. It was the sense of betrayal that hung all around. He'd done something terrible here, and the place remembered. Pax, he called, not caring if anyone heard him. Let the dupes come, let a whole army come. He wasn't leaving without his fox. Pax! Against his shout, the silence grew only deeper, ominous now, not promising. He started along the road again, calling and keeping his eyes to the gravel shoulder. He was sure Pax had had the toy soldier in his mouth when the car had peeled away. Whenever Pax had given up on Peter, he would have dropped it. Peter wanted to hold it, hold it in his hands again, a solid proof that his fox had been here. He walked a quarter mile, a half mile, eyes down, and then he stopped short. He wasn't going to find that toy soldier. Pax, because Pax wouldn't have given up. Not ever. Pax would never have thought he'd, ab he'd been abandoned. They were inseparable. Pax had known it all along. Peter was the one who'd have had to learn it. If Pax wasn't here, he must have gone home to find Peter or tried. Maybe the river would have blocked him, but maybe not. Dogs made it home against crazy odds all the time. Pax was ten times smarter than any dog, so why wouldn't he be able to find his, his way? Maybe he was there right now. Home. Home is about 10 miles southeast of the old mill, and the mill was probably four miles or five, four or five miles south of where he was right now. So he'd head south, calling for packs all the way. The gorge beside the mill would be too dangerous to navigate in the dark, so he'd sleep there. Then Matt make the descent at dawn. He would cross the river where it winded out at the mill, and then after another 10 miles of trails that he knew, he'd be home. Hold on, he said aloud. I'm coming. Chapter 27. Pax woke with a start. His boy was near. He jumped to his feet, waking Bristle, who had been dozing beside him, and began to search the clearing for Peter's scent. Nothing, but he was near. Pax bolted through the trees to the ridge above the encampment. He saw no youth among the war sick. He did not hear Peter's voice among the murmurs and shouts. He crept down the hill and circled the camp as close as he dared, scenting from all directions. His boy was not there. But he was near, and he was coming. Pax returned to Bristle's side and lay down, but he did not sleep. Chapter 28 Peter traveled south for almost an hour, feeling certain that Pax... Hi! Are you reading? Yeah. <laughs> feeling certain that Pax had traveled the same route, but when he emerged from the woods, he stopped. A vast meadow sloped down for at least a mile before flattening into another mile of wide green floor. At the base of that, the land rose hundreds of feet in jagged steps as if chopped with a giant hoe. And beyond that, rolling to the horizon, was the forested plateau that hid the gorge. Since waking, he traveled nine hours without thinking of the of rest once, but now the stunning immensity of the distance ahead drained what was left of his energy. He dropped his pack and fell to the ground. Nine hours of gripping the crutch handles had stiffened his hands to claws. He forced them open and felt the raw palms split. They'd blistered the day before broken up, broken open and blistered again. A poor, a poor Oh my goodness. He poured cool water from his thermos over the hot pulp of his palms and set it set to working picking out shreds of tire rubber. Then he eased his extra pair of socks over his hands and looked out again. A movement halfway down the valley caught his eye. Something trotted in bouncing dips between two trees. Fo fox movement. 
Peter rose to his knees. Pax! There it was again, but no, whatever was there was tan, not red. Coyote, maybe. The thought was a shot of adrenaline, and suddenly he was moving again, Pax slamming against his back, crutches position down the hill, all the way to the valley bottom in just half an hour, and then sinking into the boggier ground there, muddy and slower, but still moving. And then a, a ten-foot sheer rock wall loomed in front of him. The cliffs were a lot taller than they had appeared from across the valley. Before he could second-guess himself, Peter hurled his back and then his crutches up and heard them clatter onto the stony ledge. He wedged his fingers into a crevice and pulled. His cast scraped along the rough rock face, but his arms were strong from Vola's training, and he levered himself onto a shallow foothold. From there, he reached for a jutting tree, then another crack in the rock, and then he heaved himself over the first ledge. It took an hour to climb the stepped rise that, that way, crutches and pack first and dragging himself after. When he reached the crest, panting and sweat soaked, he fell to the ground under a tall pine. He drained his thermos in one swallow and ate the last of the ham sandwiches. He opened Vola's second packet. Peanut butter. Peter's throat closed. He remembered the first time Pax had found an empty jar in the trash. He'd squeezed his snout in so deep it had gotten stuck, and Peter had laughed until it hurt. He stuffed the sandwich back into the bag, wishing he'd found it the day before, and tossed it to the dog scavenging the dumpsters, and got up again. It was almost six o'clock, and he had a ways to go still. As he traveled, the memories of those hungry-eyed animals accompanied him, darting and retreating like accusing ghosts. He wished he could tell them that he knew how it felt to have the one person who had loved you and taken care of you suddenly vanish. How the world suddenly seemed dangerous after that. He had lost a parent. How many kids this week, he wondered, had woken up to find their worlds changed that way, their parents gone off to war, maybe never coming home. That was the worst, of course, but what about the smaller losses? How many kids missed their older brothers or sisters for months at a time? How many friends had to say goodbye? How many kids went hungry? How many had had to move? How many pets had they had to leave behind to fend for themselves? And why didn't anyone count those things? People should tell the truth about what war costs, Vola had said. Weren't those things the costs of war, too? With a start, Peter found that the dark was falling around him. A little panicked, he should have been looking for a good place to settle for the night. He spun around. His left crutch shot out onto the patch of loose stones. He fell onto it hard and heard a crisp snap. For an instant, he feared rib, but the sound had been wood. He landed, still gripping the top of the crutch. Six feet away was its bottom shank. Dabblemen. It came out so natu naturally, a satisfying word. He tried out some other swears, and they felt pretty good, too, but the way the darkening wood absorbed his shouts without a response made him uneasy, so he stopped. He didn't have the luxury of venting anyway. He had a crutch to repair and not much light left. All around him, trees shot out hard wood limbs that he could tape to the broken pieces as a splint, but he had no hatchet to cut them. As he drew the bat out of his pack so he could find the tape, he realized that the solution was in his hand. He aligned the crutch pieces, laid the bat over them, then began winding the tape. When he finished, when he was finished, he tested the crutch with the, his full weight. It held strong and solid. He wished he could tell Vola she'd been right. He had needed her bat on his journey. He knelt by his pack again. The accident had been warning enough. He pulled out the things he needed to make camp for the night, then scraped a bowl in the dirt and filled it with a pile of twigs and dried grass. He touched a match to it, and a little fire crackled to life. Peter held his jackknife over the flames until he figured it was sterilized, then gritted his teeth to split open the new blisters that had formed on his palms. The pain made him grass, gasp, and he eased on some of Ola's salve and took deep breaths until it numbed. The herb smell swept him back to her kitchen with a rush, and he wondered if there he she was there now. How was she managing without the heavy leg to anchor her? Before he put his knife away, he held he held it up. The last of the firelight danced along its blade. He remembered the first time he'd seen Vola's knife, 
how shocked he'd been when he she had gouged a chip of wood out of her leg. Peter tugged up his jeans. She pressed He pressed the flat of the knife against his calf and tried to imagine slicing off a nugget of flesh because it offended him, because it wasn't perfect. A coyote howled then, and the second answered from a distance. Peter shivered. He turned the blade until the cool edge creased his flesh, then jerked it up. The slice was only half an inch, but its sting was fierce. There were advantages he could see of being made of wood. The cut beat it up. As the dark blood began to drip, he drew it into the shape of a leaping fox. Without, with his fingernail, he pricked out a pointed nose, then two ears. A wild smear of his thumb for the brush. Pax, tomorrow, a red fox blood vow. Okay, we'll be back tomorrow. Or, it's Friday. So Monday, with the next couple chapters. I hope you guys have a good weekend.